Hi there. I'm sure you've seen some of these formulas when you watched the video about the introduction to the Mohr concept. These formulas are very useful when we're talking about the topic of stoichiometry, where we find the Mohr concept. You should not only be able to remember these formulas, you should also be able to know how they are related to each other because as you can see, all of them have got N, meaning there's a relationship shared among these formulas. This is Z Online School. In this video, you and I are going to be looking at how to use more concept formulas. We're going to do this in a systematic way. By the end of this video, you should be able to know how to use the more concept formulas involving mass and relative molecular mass, how to use more concept formulas involving volume and molar volume, how to use more concept formulas involving concentration and volume. At the end of this video, we've got bonus tips for you. Make sure you watch this video till the end for you to get the maximum value out of it. The first part is us talking about the more concept when we are referring to masses. This thinking about the more was brought about by the second definition we looked at in the video about the introduction to the more concept. Well, we said an amount of mass equal to the relative molecular mass or the relative atomic mass is equal to one more. If you can remember, we said N is equal to mass of substance over the molar mass. And from this same definition, you can see we've got relative molecular mass. So if we've got a molecule and we get its relative molecular mass, then we've gotten its molar mass, which is the mass of one more. If it's an atom, on the other hand, we get the relative atomic mass and we have the molar mass of that atom. From this, we have the formula N is equal to M over MR. When using this formula, it's very important for you to note the following things. When we're finding the number of moles for a molecule, we will use the relative molecular mass. When we're finding the number of moles for an atom, we will use relative atomic mass as our molar mass. You should note that this formula can be used whenever we have mass in equation and the chemical formula of a certain compound. Because if we have the chemical formula, we can find the molecular mass and that molecular mass is equal to the molar mass. Now let's talk about how this formula can be used. The first question here is asking us to find the number of moles in 28 grams of iron. In all this video, we'll be following some sequence of steps that will enable us to get the questions about the more concept correct. The steps are very simple. Step one is identifying the formula that we will use. As you saw at the beginning of this video, we have three formulas. If we include the formula that we looked at in the introduction to the more concept, we have a total number of four formulas. So depending on how the question is phrased, we can identify which formula among those four will be used. But in this part, we'll be looking at how we can identify if it's time to use our first formula of this video. So what we do is just check if we've got masses. If we check of all those four formulas that we have, we realize that there's only one formula that involves masses, which is N is equal to M over MR. So whenever we have masses in equation, we can guess that the formula we'll be using is this one. Now, after we do that, the next process or the next step is us identifying the data that we need. Usually, the confusion comes when you talk about the molar mass. Like I said, if we're finding the moles for an atom, we use the atomic mass. If we're finding the moles for a molecule or a compound, we use the molecular mass. Now, the question is, do we have a molecule or an atom? Our question is asking us to find the number of moles in 28 grams of iron. In chemistry, when you just have an element name like this, this will be taken as an element or an atom of iron because if we think about the metal iron, it's made up of a group of iron atoms. So in this case, we'll be just focusing on the relative atomic mass of iron. All these relative atomic masses we'll be talking about can be found on the periodic table. And as you can see right now, the atomic mass of iron is 56. So we know our data is enough. Now, the third thing you should always look for is checking if your units for that data you've collected is correct. In this formula, always make sure your mass is in grams. If it's in kilograms, find a way of making that mass back to grams. With that said and done now, the fourth step involves us just solving. 
for each of these formulas we'll be using in this video these are the four steps we'll be following so it's quite a good idea if you wrote them somewhere if you think you forget about them so we have the 28 grams and the 56 for the iron on the periodic table i'm sure you saw it and therefore if we punch this in our calculator we can have the answer so we're saying 28 divided by 56 as you can see the answer gives us 0 0.5 and that's the answer we'll write there as you can see it is a very simple process however never think the topic of more concept or stoichiometry will be as easy as this sometimes because of the relationships between the different formulas it might become a bit complex let's look at example two in example two we have been asked another question find the number of moles in 0 0.05 kg of hydrated copper 2 sulfate if you know how to write your chemical formulas, you can read this in the right way. If we remember those steps, the first is us identifying the formula that we'll be using. As you can see, we've got mass here, meaning we'll be using the equation which involves mass, which is N is equal to M over MR. The next is identifying the data we need. We need mass and we need molar mass. We have the mass there you can see it's already there now we don't have our molar mass now the question is do we have a molecule or an atom as you can see we've got a molecule so we'll be using relative molecular mass and now how do we calculate that well if you can remember for iron we just went to the periodic table and checked its relative atomic mass even for molecules and compounds it's practically the same thing the only difference is that for a molecule we've got a group of elements that are making it up so we need to add up all those atomic masses for each element and then get the molecular mass now i'm sure it will be easy for us to get the molecular masses for copper sulfate here but it might become a bit difficult when we have this now what do i mean it might become a bit difficult we have the five here now, what does that 5 mean? That 5 means we've got 5 molecules of water. That's very important to note because if you just think of the 5 affecting the hydrogen alone, you might get your relative molecular mass wrong. If we have 2 atoms of hydrogen in each molecule of water, and then we have 5 molecules of water, it means we have 5 H2. And then again, if in 1 molecule of water, we have 1 oxygen, it means if we have five molecules of water, we have five oxygens. The simple thing to do here is just to remember that this five affects each of the elements in this molecule. Now, our job is just writing the right numbers. Here we've got one atom of copper, one atom of sulfur, four atoms of oxygen in the copper two sulfate. And then we go to this molecule of hydration we have 10 hydrogens and 5 oxygens. Whichever method you use to find your molecular mass, you should be able to get the actual numbers of the atoms that are involved. Some people might just get each atom individually. What I mean is they might just get the number of copper, the number of sulfur, the number of oxygen, and the number of hydrogen. The problem with that is you should have practiced enough such that you don't forget that you need to add this 5 and this 4 for you to get 9 molecules in total of oxygen in this compound. What remains now is checking the atomic masses for each of these atoms on the periodic table. What you do right now is just grab a piece of paper and then follow me through carefully. I'm asking you to write down the atomic masses for copper sulfur oxygen and hydrogen okay now we just need to multiply this one by the atomic mass of copper because we have one copper meaning 64 will be multiplied by that one for sulfur if you can check your paper where you wrote those values down we have 32 for oxygen you can check we had 16 hydrogen is the simplest by the end of this video you should know it one for hydrogen and a 16 for oxygen again after we have this it means 
this product here should be added to the product of this and just like that meaning we'll add the 64 to this 32 and then 16 times 4 you can see we have another 64 10 times 1 is just 10 16 times 5 we have 80 now what we need to do is find the sum of these numbers we add them all together using a calculator We've got 64, 32, 64, 10, and 80. As you saw, we had 250. That's our molar mass. Meaning, if we get 250 grams of this compound, we have one more of that compound. Now, the next thing is us getting the mass. Now, remember that step 3 involves us checking our data if it's in the correct units. It's rare that your molar mass will be in another unit, but for mass, sometimes it might be given in kg. And remember I said you should make sure your mass is in grams. So we need to convert this kg into grams. How do we do that? We're going to do that with some proportion here. We know that 1000 grams is equal to 1 kg. Therefore, x grams will be equal to 0 0.05 kg. What you should note when you're using proportion is that your grams should be on the same side of the equal sign and your kg should be on the same side of the equal sign. Then we cross multiply. So that one and that x give us x kgs is equal to 1000 multiplied by 0 0.05. 1000 times 0 0.05 will give us 50 grams. Note that the g and the kg multiply so we have g kg. For those who are not sure, let me just do it on the calculator so that you can see that it's actually true. Okay, I'm sure even those who are doubting are now sure now. What we do is cancel out the units that we don't need. We don't need the kg, so we're going to divide both sides by kg. But I like putting a 1 in front so that everything looks mathematically right. So the kg and kg there will cancel out. Even here it will cancel out. As you can see, our unit that's left is grams. The addition of units here is one of another way in which you can know if you've done your proportion in the right way. If, let's say, you had kg left after you cancel, it means somewhere as you are making the proportions here, you've gotten something wrong. So we know that x is 50 grams. Now we can use this formula just as we did for example 1. So you've got a 50 and then we had this 250, which was our molar mass. And we find that on a calculator. It gives us 0 0.2. Remember, these are the units for moles. It's very funny. They just remove the E. One thing you should note is this. Whenever you have the number 1 here as your answer, you never put an S. However, for any other values, you keep putting S's. For example, 0 0.1 will be written as 0 0.1 moles. Now let's look at a third example. In this third example, we're trying to stretch our knowledge about the first formula and you see why I'm saying this. We've been asked to find the molar mass and the mass of X. Let me read the whole question for you to understand what I mean. If 10 grams of X bicarbonate is exactly 0 0.1 moles of X bicarbonate, determine the molar mass of x bicarbonate and the mass of x what they are telling us here is that if you get 10 grams of this compound you will exactly get 0 0.1 moles so determining the molar mass of this compound won't be that difficult because we don't need to use the atomic mass of each of these elements found in this compound if you remember we have this formula already so if we make the molar mass the subject of the formula, we can use mass and number of moles which have been given to find the molar mass. So that's what I'm just going to do here. N is equal to M over MR divided by 1. I divide by 1 to make both sides fractions. Then I cross multiply. And now I have this equation M multiplied by MR is equal to m that one doesn't change anything so i divide both sides by n and now i have mr as the subject so this is another formula that you can use in the more concept 
but it's rare that you talk about it like a formula because if you know this first one you can easily come up with this second one now our job is just knowing the data that we need step two then checking if our data is in the correct units yes it's in grams there the most it's rare that you find it in another unit so then we work it out 10 divided by 0 0.1 So the molecular mass of this compound is 100 grams per mole. If you've been actually observing what's been happening in example 1 and 2, we got the molar mass by adding the atomic masses of each of the elements in this compound, right? So we get X, which we don't know, the H, the C, and the three oxygens like that. Now for X, what are we going to do? I'm sure that's the only difficult part. Maybe you know how to work out these parts. For X, we don't know the mass, and that's the mass we want to find. So we'll just label the mass as X. It's important to write these numbers of the atoms that are found in the compound. Then you multiply by the atomic masses. Hydrogen, like I told you, is the simplest. Always remember it's one, so you don't need to check the periodic table. Now for carbon and oxygen, you can check them. You can see that carbon is 12 and oxygen is 16. So we're going to multiply this carbon by 12 and the oxygen by 16. X will be just X like that. 1 multiplied by 1 will be 1. 1 multiplied by 12 will be 12. Maybe 16 by 3 you need a calculator but you can do that. So we have 48. Now our job is adding 48 plus 12 and that 1. As you can see it gives us 61 now we can't add x and 61 so we're going to have an expression of the molar mass now remember that if the molar mass of this compound is 100 like we found here it means that this same expression should be equal to 100 and now if we have this like this we can easily find the value of x we can subtract 61 from both sides and then get our value or you can just think of it as getting this 61 and taking it over to the other side of the equal sign and changing its sign this side it's plus so if it goes this side it will become negative so x will be equal to 100 minus 61 as you saw on the calculator it's 39 so our mass of x is 39. 